Good evening. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Holven, and this is the first of seven sessions that we're going to have in this winter's module about the evolution of consciousness and humanity. I'm so glad to be back with you again for another module in the lectures and studies of anthroposophy. Dear friends, this is a topic which I did already two full years ago. In fact, in fact, the study of the human being and the universe, the universe and matter, was the first of all of the webinars that I did two years ago. And I am so acutely aware that it's a subject that is so profound, so deep, that it's worth coming back to again and again. And so already two years ago, I promised that we would turn to this again, and we've arrived at that point. If you have already done this study with me or on your own, I hope and I trust that this will be another chance for a deep dive into this work. And if you're new to it, welcome. Having worked with this material for, my goodness, what could it be? nearly 50 years. It's material that is very dear to my heart, and I am committed to helping to offer this worldview to people to give us strength and sustenance on our path. I'm going to begin this evening with words of introduction, and I'd like to start by speaking this truth. The world as we know it has changed. The world has changed dramatically from the world that I grew up in all those many years ago, before computers, or certainly long before the age of personal computers. And now the computers, the cell phones, all of this is omnipresent in our lives. And we have to really observe how much that has changed in our image of ourselves as human beings. Again and again, we are faced with the urgent question, what is a human being? And I trust that all of you are asking that question as well. It is the question of our time, the existential question of humanity. And for those who can't find answers and orientation to this fundamental question, what is a human being? Without this, we have the tremendous onslaught in our age of depression, sometimes debilitating, suicide, violence, drugs, a kind of dissolution of culture at the same time that we have the rampant increase of entertainment industries and so on. Where do we find the thread that helps us to find the deep, deep meaning that our hearts are longing for in life? And as I sent out the invitation and the announcement of this webinar series, I wrote with it these questions, just as some of the questions how can we gain a spiritual understanding of the world, a spiritual understanding of ourselves that will give us a vision and a purpose for our existence? What other question is there? How can I gain a spiritual understanding? How can I spiritually understand myself, but also the worlds of nature, the worlds of substance? this material world that I live in, a spiritual understanding of this world so that my life of stewardship and service to the earth can truly make a difference. How can I orient myself? And in envisioning this series and bringing it again, I also am thinking particularly of people who have professions of service including many of the professions that are rooted in anthroposophy, although that is by no means a prerequisite, people who are Waldorf teachers, people who are biodynamic farmers, gardeners, 
an anthroposophical seeker or healer. All of these concepts that we're going to look at in the evolution of the earth and humanity and consciousness, all of these are so important that we constantly permeate ourselves with trying to understand them so that we're not just memorizing anthroposophical facts as diagrams and dogma. This is all worthless. We have to find a way of thinking these thoughts that they touch our hearts with their warmth. And I included in my list one more question. What is the healthy way for the modern human being to interact with the world of technology? Because even as I mentioned at the beginning, we are so immersed, so entwined in technology. And we don't want to be Luddites turning away from the world of technology. We want to be firmly grounded and engaged in it, even as it surrounds us on all sides and threatens to thwart our understanding of our humanness. As I wrote in the invitation, this work will be grounded on, oriented towards the work of Rudolf Steiner, the great spiritual teacher, his work, and especially this book, An Outline of Esoteric Science. I've got both of my copies here with me. This one I got back in the 1970s. It's so dog-eared, so full of information. My first reading of this was with a name that some of you will know, Willie Sucher, who, when I was a Eurythmy student, he lived at the place of our Eurythmy training, and we had weekly studies with this old sage who studied the star wisdom and accompanied us in the Eurythmy training for four years. He was our first guide through this work. And now this is my current copy, new translation. An all outline of occult science or esoteric science. Now let's turn again to why are we working with Rudolf Steiner? Who was he? He was an exceptionally wise and articulate person. He was absolutely a spiritual teacher. He was a man of his time, but I would say his world wisdom is so comprehensive, he is beyond times was trained in the natural sciences, and that is an imprint for all of the teaching that he does. He honored and valued the natural scientific way of working. I'll speak more about that in just a moment. But he was also an initiate, meaning a great spiritual teacher. I want to speak a little bit more about that in a minute, too. What is an initiate? but he was really one of the wise teachers of humanity. I'll come back to that. But he called his work anthroposophy, the wisdom of the human being. And he also called it spiritual science. So his every aspiration in his heart was to make our spiritual quest scientific. That is permeated with clear thinking, not with mysticism, not with vague thinking and wish fulfillment or manifesting wealth or whatever we want. No, clear thinking. And as he unfolded his life work, he unfolded the, he started by giving us the foundations for understanding the meaning of life. So allow me to keep working with this a little bit with you before we get into the topic of the occult science, at the root of his work is the idea that the universe is not a mechanical universe. This universe has been created out of beings, wise and loving, super conscious beings. And in or as offspring of or contained within this ultimate being are also rainbows of other beings 
all of whom have different levels of consciousness. And Rudolf Steiner gives us names of nine different degrees of beings. It really helps to think of them as colors. Some of them have absolutely comprehensive, godlike intelligence. Some are quite close to us. But we can speak of a ladder of beings. We'll come to that soon. And when we use that terminology, we will say, in that context, we as human beings are the younglings, we're the children, we're the newborn, we're the growing point of this. We are seeds for the future of the universe. Take that into your heart for a minute. We are not an unimportant and nearly invisible speck of dust in the universe. We are of tremendous significance to everything that happens in the universe. All of these beings, these rainbows of beings are evolving. And so is the human being. We're constantly evolving, as are all these other beings. And what surrounds us as stars, as planets, as movements, as earth and nature and soil, as mind and heart, what surrounds us all is the evolution forwards in time. We human beings, more than the other beings, are living in, entwined in, immersed in the earth. We don't live here through all of our existence, but right now as I'm talking to you, as you're listening, for the decades of your life, you are intimately connected to this earth. And you will be again and again in more lifetimes than you have been long before. We are intimately connected to the, this earth, this carbon-based reality. That is, we're not here to go off and try to live on Mars. Thank you, Elon Musk, but I'm not remotely interested. This sacred earth with its rivers and grasses and air, plants, this is all the stuff that my embodiment is created out of. I live in this. I have sunk myself into this earth. And for decades, I will continue to live in it until I pass through the portal of death. Live with that thought for a moment. It engenders in me amazement and gratitude and commitment. We are living in this carbon-based reality, but out of all these other rainbows of beings, not all of these intelligent beings are carbon-based. In fact, we're really the ones that are carbon-based. I don't have any, any tendency, any credence to think that there are extraterrestrial UFOs that are going to come in here on in bodies that we can touch and so on. No, not that. I'm sure that we're surrounded by other beings who don't have bodies. Just as when I sleep, I'm not living in my body, but I have other experiences. Our intelligence is not ultimately dependent upon having bodies, but to go through the eye of the needle in this time and space, yes, we need our bodies. Who we are as beings is a great work in process. And what we are, who, who we are and what our place is, this, this is our great mission and task. We have been other things at other times in histories. We have been less conscious beings. We've had different consciousnesses. But now our consciousness has everything to do with this incredible plunge into materialism. And that's what we have to deal with as we tell our stories with modern minds. We humans have been telling each other stories about our creation for long ages. And we can see these stories, the ancient times drawn on the cave dwellings, on the, the walls of their caves, 
on the pot shards that we have collected by the archaeologists before people could write. We also have other myths handed down to us. We have, of course, in many cultures, the myth of the turtle god, that humanity is living on top of the turtle. We have the story of Krishna, the Indian god of this beautiful blue body with ultimate purity, his role in evolution. We have the story of Adam Kadman, a um, figure prominent in the Hebraic tradition. Adam Kadman as this huge mm, prototype of the human being and the earth out of which humanity developed. We have them from the Egyptian stories. We have Isis and Osiris. Isis, the great goddess of wisdom who gave birth to the sun, who was killed, and so on. We have, of course, the paradise story in many, many cultures, which many of us know quite, quite fluently in the story of Adam and Eve. There are more recent histories. There are Greek gods and goddesses. And in all of these stories, in a language appropriate for the different times of humanity, we humans told each other who we are, what we are, what the gods want of us, and what they are doing. And those stories made sense in those times. Can you think that? Can you think of yourself? living in that childlike age. Try to engender that picture in yourself when you were satisfied with that language. Because it's not appropriate to be satisfied with that same language now. But it is enlightening to realize that those, those languages lie deep in the levels of our being, in our past, when we lived in Greece when we lived in the Hebraic, when we lived in Africa and Asia and all the places that we have been, those stories educated us in different ways. And at each step, these stories evolved even as we evolved. What does that mean? Can we actually believe that these ancient people saw elemental beings, they, they actually saw nature beings and spoke with them and talked to them? Can we actually believe that they saw the gods? Or now our story has a very different quality, doesn't it? Our story, our consciousness now focuses on the material world. So I would like to say that to people who are depressed, who can't find the faith in life, so much of that comes from the fact that we feel alienated from story, from meaning. Now it is very tempting for the modern mind to say that there cannot be any spiritual beings, that there can't be any gods because we can't see them anymore, that everything in the universe is a great machine. That's the story we tell us now. But why? This is not because it's true in that form, but because this way of looking at things is a reality for our contemporary mindset, for our mechanical mind. It is part of our evolving story that we have come to an existential, I mean that literally an existential crisis point, where we say, I don't feel the gods anymore. This is a nihilistic point of existence. If I'm quite honest with myself. I actually feel the aloneness of my being, but I can go deeper. I know that there must be spirit. We're all on that journey on a little bit different point. I don't know if you're in the visionary point or the depressed point, but in all honesty, where are we now? What are we looking at in this very materialistic world? Of course, many of the wisest physicists 
on the earth already say the world is not a machine, that all of this bears so much wisdom in it, it must have been created out of a consciousness, but it's still hard for us to access it. And so we turn to somebody like Goethe, who was a great teacher for Rudolf Steiner. They didn't know each other personally. They lived in different centuries, but he was a great, a great teacher for Steiner. And he said, we must learn to look at the world as an open secret. An open secret, what does that mean? That if we learn to walk through, through the world with open gaze and really let the world impress us freshly every time and not try to, and not just look at it mechanically or as if we've seen it a dozen times. I've seen that tree, I don't even notice it. These flowers, I'm sure they'll be there. The soil, it's okay. If we so often ignore the things that are miracles around us, and if instead we learn to understand the language of nature, in fact, we're already in a good, a good part of the way on our journey towards resurrecting our own consciousness, not out of mysticism, not out of wish fulfillment or sentimentality, but out of an awake consciousness. Again, the fault of the human mind at our time is to say our brains are just machines. And I confess that I always get distressed when people say, oh, my brain was thinking that I can't manage my brain. My brain, the wiring in my brain made that happen. I get so frustrated with this. My brain is not a machine. Your brain is not wired. You have no electric cords in your brain and your neurons are not electric cords. But the human spirit has a rightful relationship to perceiving activities in the body and deriving from what happens in the body, meaning. But what hap there are so many kinds of meaning that we can derive what's from what's going on in the body. We just have to learn how to do that and do that better and better all the time. So I want to return again in these preparatory moments, paragraphs, I want to return to the idea of the great spiritual teachers, the initiates, because there have always been initiates in the world. As I said, we are all evolving. We're evolving in so many ways. Our bodies are evolving or perhaps even devolving. They're becoming more and more hard as even I know in the last century, as a, as a eurythmist, with my perception, I see that people's bodies are becoming less fluid, less agile than they were previously. As we become more intellectual, that is also reflected in the way that we carry our bodies. We are always evolving in our consciousness, but and the initiates are evolving faster than we are. They have a level of consciousness that the rest of us will catch up later. I said that we have all of these different levels of being, this rainbow of different consciousnesses. And we could say that we're at the bottom or we're at the growing point of all of that, the lowest, the 10th out of a series of 10 hierarchies. And just above us, the beings with a, a bit more, not, not huge, but a bit more awareness than us are the angels who don't have physical bodies. They have bodies that live in the life zone. And the angels are, they have a, um, as I said, a body free consciousness. They can access the cosmic imaginations directly. An initiate is someone who can already do that. And the rest of us will be doing that maybe in a hundred years, maybe in 300, maybe in a thousand years, but we're all working on ourselves to develop the next levels of consciousness and the next and the next. 
And that's the game that we're looking at now. Can we evolve upwards or will the computers evolve us downwards? Will we lose so much of our hopeful mindfulness that we just become passive consumers of entertainment, artificial technology? Or will we learn how to develop our super sensible, again, I use that word, super sensible, more than sensory capacities. The ancient teachers are the ones who were the storytellers in ancient days. And as storytellers, they were also the ones who were responsible for the spiritual evolution of humanity to make sure that as we took our baby steps, that we would do it safely and responsibly. They taught we must worship in this way. We must pray in this way. We must act as a society in this way. And the mystery teachers had direct knowledge of spiritual lawfulness, all the stars and the constellations as background to our universe were guiding humanity. That would even go to how to plant, when to plant, how to hunt, and so on. And the great spiritual teachers had schools, and they're called the mystery schools or the mystery temples. And they, the teachers, the spiritual teachers, needed to bring other people into the work of being spiritual teachers as well. And so it was not uncommon for them to look into their community and see a child who was blessed, a child who was promising, and bring them into the mystery temples, take them from their family, and raise them. And they would take them through different levels of teaching so that they could become also initiated in the knowledge. And the levels of teaching involved many things, usually hardship training, so also physical training to have a healthy body, but also uh, trainings to become courageous, trainings to go through fear, and so on, until they could break through to an understanding of the spiritual world out of which we are born and that we access every night when we die. So there have always been mystery or esoteric traditions in our world. And these traditions have evolved in a way appropriate for every, every age. In our time, there still exists secret brotherhoods and also priesthoods, even some of the priesthoods of the churches. And these priesthoods and brotherhoods have vows of silence that they consider that people who aren't ready to learn how to access the spiritual world need to be protected from learning that. Indeed, it can be dangerous for a person to learn spiritual things that they're not ready for. And so these initiate teachers would demand of each student and, and themselves that they wouldn't teach things that people aren't ready for. And therefore, these priests had a certain kind of power over society, and people were asked to be obedient and submissive to them. There's this background to who was Rudolf Steiner, because he certainly had a connection to all the ancient mystery streams, most certainly. But he, incarnating 1861, living you know, just 100, 150 years ago, he was the foremost Western initiate. And not of the Eastern stream, they have a little different flavor, but in my understanding, as the Western initiate, his, what he taught was also valid for all of the initiate streams around the world. And Rudolf Steiner had a different vision from the vow of secrecy. He said that 
the current state of humanity, and listen carefully to this, the current state of humanity, where we're entwined in this ever-increasing world of materialism and intellectuality, this the forces of the deadening of nature and the deadening of the human spirit, this current state of humanity demands that we must now each have access to all of the teachings of spirituality that we are able to develop to them. We have the human capacities for understanding. That's what we are now. We are, have become not just working laborers, not the great singers of you know the bards and so on, we are all thinking beings, logical, suck, suck, suck. We know how to think things in logical order. But now we have to pay more attention to the things that we are thinking. We must learn to use our well-trained minds to work on ourselves, to polish our own instrument, I would say. Instead of going to temples, we must go out into the world, like Goethe had said, and learn to really look at the world. We must seek to educate our own self. Again, educate our own self so that we learn to be sensitive, to be delicate, to really be alive and awake in the, this very hard world that we live in. Instead of going undergoing rites and rituals for our initiations, we must accept now that the entire world is our education, is our temple. Let's be aware, we're not looking in any sense, we're not looking for a return to mystical beliefs, ecstatic, incense-filled, leaving the body, opening to the great source like this, right? We're not looking for that. We're not looking for sentimentality in our spiritual search. And by no means are we looking for superstition. We're looking for a diligent and rigorous path of honesty and truth. But we have to learn to ask and pay attention to different things than where the mechanical mindset is trying to get us to look. We must learn to develop these new organs of sensitivity, these super sensible organs of perception. We must not just believe in elemental beings or angels and so on and fairies, but we must learn how to sense them, how to sense the world of spirit that's all around us. It's as if we almost need to just scratch on the surface of what's coming into our eyes and another world will become perceptible to us. Let me say that again. We almost just need to unzip, <laughs> crack open, must learn how to do that so that we can see the reality of what's going on around us and not just the maya, which is on the outermost level of the perceptions. Well, think about that for a moment. How do we look into the living world of spirit all around us? We may learn to recognize patterns and dynamics in life. And we may see through what we learn how to read in the events of life, the truth of reincarnation to our past lives and to our future lives. We just have to ask different questions and not just assume that our brain is a machine <laughs> wired to learn a certain kind of truth. In this spirit, in this process of developing, we have to find a different way of giving ourselves the challenges that the temples used to give us. We must cultivate, it's so important, out of our own initiative, a very strong and moral inner life. So that I would even say we must become so clean, polished inside us that even the spiritual world can perceive us 
that they can look into us and we're just not, we're not just shadowy beings. We must learn to practice certain things like courage, spiritual courage. We must learn clear mindedness and honest thinking. We must cultivate acknowledgement of all that is great and cultivate gratitude. We must develop commitment to what we have chosen to follow. And as Rudolf Steiner says, don't forfeit an intention that we have made unless we have the insight that an intention that we have made is wrong, in which case we should let it go. We need self-discipline and focus and the knowledge that everything that we are doing in our thinking and in our feeling makes a difference. This isn't just a private little set of neurons in my head, wires. No, everything that is living inside me directly affects what's going on outside of me. We must learn all that to save what it means to be a human being, this grand adventure as we evolve. Will you think about that for a moment? What are we? It is out of this very clear thinking that Rudolf Steiner has written all of his books. He wrote them and gave his lectures in German, which is already a pretty difficult language, elegant in its complexity, but a mouthful, and then challenge, translated into English, it can be tough. It, but some people say anthroposophy is just far too difficult for me. I want to just read another spiritual teacher who can make it much more understandable for me. We don't understand the value of making an effort to really exercise our consciousness, to overcome all the things in our age that would make us passive thinkers. We need to be conscious in ourselves. So I believe I have set a pretty good foundation for these first steps that we're going to take. And so now let's begin with a few more thoughts that lay the foundation as we go, as we start this journey of cosmic evolution. And we begin with this first picture. We are all spiritual beings. Yes not a machine, not an accident. We're all spiritual beings. As spiritual beings, we live in body, a body that has been woven as a gift out of the things of the earth. And this process of being embodied has been a pro in a process of developing since literally the beginning of time. But what being a spirit in a body was at the beginning of, a, of time is vastly different from what it is now. Because when we think of body now, we think of carbon and the first body that we had had nothing to do with carbon or material. It was just a, an encasement, a sheath of thought, essentially, a sheath of warmth. Hold that one. That's going to be the first step we take when we begin talking about the evolution of matter, spirit and matter. But we will begin with this picture that you live in a body and your spirit finds its way into the body. So I'll begin with the most simple of all diagrams that we make. Some of you know this diagram ever so well. Just a second, let me make sure that you can see the screen well. 
simple diagram. And I will just start with a downward facing triangle. This downward facing triangle in this case symbolizes the material world, which in our time has become hardened, has become matter. That's not the only thing it can be. But our spiritual nature, I will draw as an upward facing triangle. And that has opened doors to unlimited consciousness, to higher beings, towards planets and constellations. And this has doorways open to the earth. I'm going to draw a few more triangles here just to begin and anticipate where we will go in the coming weeks. If this is the material world, I could do that better. And this is the spiritual world. I'm drawing a situation where spirit and matter are not overlapping in the same way, not even touching. And when we go deeper, I'll say, this is the mineral world. The mineral world is great. This upward facing triangle goes all the way to God, all the way to the stars, far, far, far above. But it doesn't show up in the material world. And if a spiritual consciousness can't be in a physical body, then it doesn't have consciousness here. We say the same thing for the angels, actually. They have vast high consciousness, different from this, but they have this vast high consciousness, but not in the physical world. That's our job. Let me draw a second triangle here. And a little bit closer. And I, we would say this being is still open, lots and lots of being is connected to high spiritual impulses. This is like a plant, a plant which has more of a connection, can actually work, work into matter, but doesn't have its own consciousness in matter. And a third being the animal kingdom in which they touch, but they're not penetrated. Animals have a kind of consciousness here in the sense world, but it's different from ours. It's a consciousness that is vaguely dreaming everything that it touches in the world. And we'll talk more about that later, but animals are so harmoniously woven into this world. They, they respond beautifully to the world of nature. They, everything that they do is walking in the map, the material world in harmony with their instincts. And we as human beings are in that sense, in a different stage of evolution, or that's why we speak of the human being as the culmination of evolution, because in the human being, spirit has come into the physical world and is conscious in matter. But how conscious are we? And that's the question. To the extent that we get so caught up, so tied up, so engaged in, so lost in, so consumed by the experience of being in matter, that we forget to look, to open the doors to something spiritual, to that extent, we kind of sever our connection to the spiritual world. But to the extent that we lift, take responsibility for our embodiment, lift ourselves to our self-education, we open to the spiritual world. And I'm going to draw in, to fill in this place where we have the overlapping triangles. And this is what we call the soul. Think about this for a moment. Soul is a concept that is not fully articulated by many people. 
for many people, the concept of soul and spirit are identical. And I would say not identical. They are related, but the soul, my human soul, is what I'm living in, the world I'm living in, when spirit and matter interact. This is where I'm awakening, where I'm growing, and so on. So we are body, soul, and spirit. And spirit is our root in the foundation. I'll bring this one back in just a minute here. So let's think about that for a minute. What does it feel like to be in your body? Limited and also free. The spirit, God is found in the earth. God made the earth. Spirit, the great universal consciousness, together with all of this, this rainbow of other beings, all these so-called hierarchies, made earth, rocks, subterranean levels, made all of that. Spirit created that. And also, out of the substance of the earth created our bodies that we're living in. God is in the earth. God is in the body. Is God in your soul? God in the spirit world? Yes, definitely. Can we access God in all these different levels? In earlier times, in earlier times, we would say we were a little bit more like this, or the doors... <laughs> The doors of the earlier human being, choosing my colors here, the doors, maybe this was an earlier human being. And we would just kind of touch in and go out again in sleep, in mystical states, in trances, and so on. We weren't as tightly interwoven as we are now. So that's... Those are the generations that we have lived through in all of our thousands of years on the earth. But now we're getting more and more entwined with all of the promise and difficulty of that. We have a different kind of consciousness in the body, in the soul, and in the spirit. In general, in the spirit, we're not as conscious as we need to be. In the, most of our conscious experiences are in the soul. In the body, our consciousness is vague. It is enchanted. It's not, it's not clear there. Now, the world of spirit, the world of spirit out of which we were born is the world of God, pure beings. This world, it's easy for us to think of it as way out there, the starry world, but it's actually the world beyond the stars. And the stars are, if you will, they're the indications, the, the glittering into the sense world of great spiritual beings. And we have brought that spiritual world with us into here. God has made sure that that spiritual world was involved in making all of this matter. But every time we are born, we bring a new spark individuated from that world into this world. Again, in the acts of creation, matter was made out of spirit. Your, the possibility for us to have a body was made. The possibility for us to individuate was made. But every time you are born, you come from out of the spiritual world and trust to embody yourself in matter. You have brought that world with you. What does that feel like? What does that thought offer us? And 
our task is on the one hand to be deeply touched by that, to dare to try that thought on. Why should that be any less true than the thought that you're a machine, you might ask yourself. But then how can we awaken to the knowledge that that's real? And we can do that. We can do that. But we, we must first have that thought sparked back to life in us. You were there. Excuse me. You were there before you were born. And you will return there after you die slowly. Not, not like that. It takes a while to get back to source. Because after we die, the spiritual world feels us as an, mm, you've become a little bit sticky having lived on the earth and denied us for so many cent oh, decades. But yet we have to polish you up a little bit before you can return fully into the spiritual world. It's kind of a funny thought, but I would look at it like that. Death is not the end. But death is a transitional state. And again, we have different kinds of consciousnesses here or immediately after death or when we're in the great universe, which is so big that we are barely conscious. And then we come back again, all the time evolving our consciousness. And I would say a core understanding in anthroposophy is that with the possible exception of very, very high initiates, we cannot be conscious in the spiritual world. We cannot do that. We're not strong enough. We will. This is our future. This is what we're evolving towards. But now we're not yet conscious. So we are born from the spiritual world and we die into the spiritual world. There become a seed for the new life. But also every night when you go to sleep, you enter the same spiritual world. Because at nighttime, your soul and spirit disconnect from the physical body. And your physical body and your so-called etheric body, your life body, heal your instrument from whatever harm you did to it during the day. And the soul and spirit return to their own world and are rejuvenated by reconnecting to their archetypes. And then when we awaken in the morning, we clothe ourselves again in our bodies, in the physical body, the life body, the etheric body, and the astral body. And these are the cores that we live in. I'll write the names on the board in just a second. And every day, while we are here on earth during our lifetime, we live in this sacred instrument. Why? Why don't we just stay with God? Because we need to individuate with wisdom. We need to evolve ourselves. We need to grow or else I like to say, I'm truly responsible for the spark of divine consciousness that, I, that was given to me when I was born. I'm responsible to that. And I'm responsible to it and not to just give it away, squander it on passive learning and too, too many Netflix productions and so on and so on. I need to clean it. I need to polish it. I need to develop it so that I can be a citizen of greater worlds eventually, you know? And I will meet this every lifetime I come back here, developing more and more, becoming maybe more angelic in future times. So when we come in, we need to ensure that we have a healthy body that we can work in, right? That we can learn in, we can be coordinated in, we can work, do deeds in this world. And then we also develop feeling life, feel the joys and the sorrows of life, the suffering, as well as the blessing, because we grow through all of that. And we learn the lessons of our life. We use, we use this lifetime. 
And all of this serves for the purpose of life on earth, for individuating ever more spiritually aware and ever more loving. It said, uh, Rudolf Steiner said that God created the world and God created us within the world, but we ourselves must take our own evolution into our hands and give it the final polish. We must polish ourselves to become worthy of this life. And so, as I said, we incarnate. That's here we dive down into the earth again and again and excarnate into the spiritual world for a while. And each time we live in this world, we live in a different state. We have lived in mythological consciousness. We've lived in fairy tale, con mystical consciousness. We have been rich. We've been poor. We've been healers, priests, or farmers, or servants. We should have done it all. Man, woman, warriors, beaten, all of it. And everything is polishing what we are. Rudolf Steiner says, in general, we come to the earth only when circumstances on the earth have changed enough that we can learn from it. So we don't in general, come back again right away after we die. In fact, it's not helpful for us to go come back right away. The best circumstance is if we can go deeply or highly into spiritual spaces after a lifetime and then be reintegrated into the earth at the end, at after much time, so that we have really accessed, again, the highest, most profound sources of spiritual power and understanding and health and archetypes before we come into the earth so that we're strong enough to deal with being a human in our age. There's also people who are too much, too strongly knit into life and go all the way back into spirit after they die. And they might just go a little bit and they stay stuck in the world of shades, of shadows, a much more dark and unenlightened area and have to come back to the earth again and live a life with suffering because they don't have resources drawn from the archetypes. So it really behooves us to live a life of health and spirit. So the earth was created to be a perfect image of the Father God. I'll say that again, our earth, our whole universe, our whole solar system, and our beautiful planet earth could have been, maybe should be, a perfect image of the creator. But our unprejudiced gaze tells us that it is no longer the Garden of Eden, right? Our earth is in trouble, and we are part of the trouble. Now, by that, I will never say, like some people, I will never say that we should just destroy the earth or leave the earth and not destroy it but that the earth would be better off without humans. I hope that through these conversations that we'll have, we'll see that we belong to the earth and not to Mars. The problems that the earth is having are also problems because we haven't figured out how to live with love and care and gratitude and as servants and tenders on the earth. And the reason for that is it's that is precisely our challenge to discover the freedom of being a human being and then deciding whether we're going to use our freedom in service to creation and continue to evolve 
or if we're going to just live in hedonistic pleasure of this lifetime that we have now and take from the earth all that we can rob her of. So in our story of creation, one of the most essential questions that we have to deal with, one of them is body, soul, and spirit. And we'll deal more with that going forwards. But also, what is the relationship between spirit and matter? So in my two triangles, we had a first gaze at that. We had the red was the spirit and the blue was the matter. But we also use an, an image a lot, which is called the U-curve. This will not be new to some of you, but with this, we point to an understanding of spirit here, spirit here, and the project. Let me call it any project, whether the project is building a new airplane, working in a corporation, leading the personal cor course of your own biography, whatever, the project is here and it starts with an idea or a spiritual intention. It becomes something and then its time has passed and it dies away. And so this realm here, we will call the spirit realm. And this realm here is manifestation or matter. So much more to say about that. But We will say, beginning next week, that we can post here the words that say, once long ago, our entire existence was purely spiritual. The earth, the solar system, the universe was not manifest. And step by step, the earth became more real, more what it is now. And from our current perspective, we place ourselves here. And preceding this were four, three other stages. And our whole story of esoteric science becomes interesting when we start naming these stages. And we can also envision what will come later and what comes much later beyond this curve is another story. This is not talking about the Big Bang back here. This is not talking about one zillion years ago. This is talking about the beginning of time, the first outbreath of creation, where the human being first came into being. And I dare say, if you can understand this thought, if I were an angel, I might focus this drawing a different way. They might have access to a different beginning of time than ours. This is the beginning of our time, human, the human story. And this is where we are now, at this point at which we develop our human individuality, which we individuate. We speak of the human ego, the I am here. And all of this was the development of our body and our life and our sensations, our ability to be a sentient being. Until now, this is the moment. This is the big beginning. With that, I'm going to close today, but not quite. We still have just a couple of minutes left. And as always, I like to begin my classes with just a little bit of you with me. And to end my classes with just a little bit of Eurythmy. Tonight, I chose not to begin with Eurythmy so that we could just plunge into the narration. If you would like to do this little Eurythmy with me, it's very, very simple. And you can stand like I'm standing, or you can remain seated. And we're just going to do what we call a contraction and expansion exercise. 
And to begin it, feel. I put my hand on my heart. You don't need to do that. But feel in your chest, really in the heart chakra, the buried, the hint, hidden, the golden seed of your being, your light. And now let your light sense that it is identical with the light all around you, the spirit light. So we have the microcosm, the personal cosmos, and the macrocosm. And the most basic here with me exercise creates a breathing process between macrocosm and personal world. So now please put your hands here. And then can you let your feeling go more deep than your hands are? Okay. Let your feeling be right inside the inside of you. And as if it's a seed, let this feeling grow like a plant, growing and greening, reaching out to the spirit sun. So with outstretched arms, you're touching the sources of light and love in the universe. And now the seeds, the petals of your flower will fall behind you, but you allow a new seed to be planted in your heart. And now again, feel deeper than your hands. We'll do this just a couple of times together. And I'll speak these words as we move within my heart. Shines the light of the sun. Within my soul. Weaves the warmth of the world. I will breathe into myself the light of the sun. I will feel. the warmth of the world. Light of the sun pour into me and warmth of the world. Now this last time, drop your arms, but feel yourself connecting heaven and earth as you feel warmth of the world Flow through me. Here I stand. And as you stand here, you can feel I am both a citizen. I carry this light inside me and my source. And with this consciousness, we will cultivate the doorway for how not to feel depressed in the world, not to have the courage to become fully human. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Thank you very much. Shortly, I will send out a link to the recording of this lesson. I look forward very much to seeing you again next week. And, or you seeing me, perhaps I should say. And as always, I want to deeply thank you for help, for coming, but also for making this possible with your donations, that the extent of giving, participating and giving are in balance and proportion to each other. I will give this work for free and you will be able to give what you can to make it possible for yourself and others. Thank you so much and I'll see you next week. You may write any questions or thanks that you might have in the chat. That's always enjoyable for me as we close. Thank you.